Disney is making headlines by supposedly outsmarting Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Did they really outmaneuver his takeover of Disney World's special district, or has this legal battle just begun? Hey everybody, it's AJ at Disney Food Blog. We've been closely following all of the developments regarding the dissolution of Disney World's Reedy Creek Improvement District and the new Ron DeSantis created Central Florida Tourism Oversight District. The latest developments are surprising and bring about some interesting new challenges for both sides. And apparently King Charles III has been unknowingly brought into the mix. So what's going on with Disney World and their all out battle with the Florida governor? Let's start with some backstory. The Reedy Creek Improvement District was created by the state of Florida in 1967. The Reedy Creek Improvement District was created by the state of Florida in 1967 with help from the rousing posthumous testimony from Walt Disney about his concept for Epcot. Remember that Epcot was originally intended to be a place where around 20,000 people would live and work, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. This special district gave Walt Disney World complete control over its own municipality, which is around 40 square miles in size, about the same size as San Francisco or just a bit smaller than the country of Liechtenstein. This includes Lake Buena Vista and Bay Lake, as well as some unincorporated land just on the outskirts of Osceola and Orange Counties. The Reedy Creek District had complete control over services like power, water, sewage, garbage collection, road construction and maintenance, environmental testing and monitoring, and fire protection and emergency medical services. Disney only needs to outsource elevator inspections and property tax collections to the county and state. They can do everything else themselves. The district also had the ability to establish their own court system, as well as operate hospitals and medical testing facilities, airports, and even a nuclear power plant. Things that haven't come to pass, but would have been important if Epcot had been created as planned. In 1968, after the original plans for Epcot had been scrapped, in a court case between the state and RCID, Disney maintained the right to issue their own tax-exempt bonds for road building and improvements, which had a huge impact on Disney World's growth in the beginning. Keeping those processes in-house let Disney build and expand faster than if they had to go through external channels. Definitely a win for the company, but special districts are generally pretty good for the community as well. Dr. Aubrey Jewett, a political science professor at University of Central Florida, who we interviewed for this story, commented, special districts are usually considered a win-win. The broader public doesn't have a say in some of the things that happen in that community, but the broader public doesn't have to pay for it. Did they get a special break when they got Reedy Creek? Yeah, absolutely. But in retrospect, was it that much more than we see other companies getting? I don't know. So here's where things stand with Disney's special district right now. To bring you up to speed, Disney's been in a battle with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis for the better part of a year over whether or not the Reedy Creek Improvement District should stay intact. Following Disney speaking out against Florida's Parental Rights and Education Bill, known as the Don't Say Gay Bill by critics, a bill was passed and later signed into law that would dissolve Reedy Creek by June 2023. Firstly, the bill would strip Reedy Creek of its power to create a nuclear power plant, which was not something Disney had ever seriously considered. And it would also impose new reporting requirements for the district. The new district would still retain power over sewage and emergency services, the ability to issue bonds, and more. Additionally, Reedy Creek would be allowed to do business as is for two years to allow time for the necessary legal and financial changes to take place. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis officially signed the bill on February 27, 2023, and appointed five new members to the Board of Supervisors for the district. Bridget Ziegler, a member of the Sarasota County School Board and a supporter of Moms for Liberty, Seminole County Attorney Michael Sass, Attorney Martin Garcia of Tampa as chairman, Ron Perry, CEO of The Gathering USA, a ministry that focuses on faith and culture, and Clearwater attorney Brian Angst. DeSantis said that this board would serve as a moral arbiter for a company that had lost its way, and the board says its first step would be conducting a sweeping financial and legal audit into Disney's behavior. Now, Reedy Creek will slowly have to begin operating under its new name, the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District. So what powers does the board have? Well, DeSantis' new board holds no power over Disney's creative decisions and what happens in the parks. They'll be on the board that oversees the new district, which controls decisions regarding the land where Disney is located. Think regulations for emergency services on Disney property, land use, debts, and various things like that. There won't be much decision-making power when it comes to the next roller coaster or table service restaurant. But there are a few big changes the board could pursue. The Central Florida Tourism Oversight District is the overarching managing entity for the land on which Disney World sits in Orlando, but there are also two cities within the district, Bay Lake and Lake Buena Vista, and the board could dissolve those. Chad Emerson, the writer of Project Future, the inside story behind the creation of Disney World, indicated that these two cities could be a sort of loophole for Disney, allowing them to keep some self-governing powers. 
Emerson shared the cities could elect to disengage from the district. They knew what they were doing in 1968, and they definitely had contingencies. They would effectively become company towns with elected city officials and mayors who are favorable to Disney. These towns are small. Only about 53 people actually live there who are primarily workers or retirees from Disney or Reedy Creek. The board wants to ensure those cities can't supersede the planning powers of the district or the district's building codes, so dissolving them could be on the agenda. The board may also make changes to the district's fire department, influence COVID-19 mandates or vaccine restrictions, or establish a new district attorney. All of these agenda items have yet to be announced, and now the board is tied up in some other developments. So let's talk about what's going on with the board right now and what's getting all these headlines. It seems the new board is considering challenging agreements made with Reedy Creek's old board that were approved before the takeover. One of those things is a developer agreement that, quote, set in stone, unquote, Disney's rights over the next 30 years, regardless of what the new board says or does. This agreement was unanimously approved by the previous board on February 8th, the day before the Florida House voted on the bill that changed the future of Reedy Creek. Per the Orlando Sentinel, the agreement allows Disney to build projects at the highest density and the right to sell or assign those development rights to other district landowners without the board having any say, according to the presentation by the district's new special legal counsel. This is called a declaration of restrictive covenants and allows Disney to have the final say on any alterations to the property, requiring the board to inform Disney of plans for such alterations without conditions or delays. The language also bars the district from using the Disney name without the corporation's approval or from using fanciful characters like Mickey Mouse. It also bars the board from regulating the height of buildings, which would be solely under the purview of the Federal Aviation Administration. According to new board member Ron Perry, the board loses the majority of its ability to do anything beyond maintain the roads and maintain basic infrastructure. And based on the language, this could be wrapped up for quite some time. If you've seen some of the headlines accompanying this development, you may be privy to the interesting clause located in Disney's legal documents. The agreement is set to be valid until 21 years after the death of the last survivor of the descendants of King Charles III, King of England. While it may seem odd, and it still kind of is, this is the rule against perpetuities in action. This legal rule prevents people or businesses from maintaining control without an end date or in perpetuity. Instead, the time frame of control is tied to a person to establish an end date that in theory coincides with the lifetime of the creators of the legal document. So why the British royals? Well, they've got an easy to establish genealogy, they're some of the most protected people on the planet, and they tend to live a long time. If Disney's agreement holds, it could be valid for quite some time. Essentially, this was Disney's insurance policy and could be why they didn't push legal challenges to prevent the changing of hands of the district in the first place. At the time of the turnover, Walt Disney World president Jeff Volley released a statement noting, For more than 50 years, the Reedy Creek Improvement District has operated at the highest standards and we appreciate all that the district has done to help our destination grow. We are focused on the future and are ready to work within this new framework. So basically, it seemed like Disney was just kind of fine with the whole thing. So what happens now? Well, when the restrictive clause was discovered, Dr. Aubrey Jewett, among other Central Florida political observers, was surprised after what Disney had stated previously, going along quietly with the changeover. But Jewett said in our interview, Disney rightfully was concerned that the new board would try to have undue influence in areas that were not in their control. They may try to impact Disney content or the Disney experience in the parks by threatening to not approve projects Disney wanted in the parks. At the moment, the restrictive clause put into place is binding and can only be challenged successfully if any clause or provision is illegal, invalid, or unenforceable under applicable present or future laws. But the new Reedy Creek Board thinks they may have an opportunity here. Gubernatorial Communications Director Taryn Fenske said in a statement that an initial review suggests these agreements may have significant legal infirmities that would render contracts void as a matter of law. The new board has hired multiple law firms to look into potential legal challenges for matters involving the district that occurred under the prior Board of Supervisors, aka that restrictive clause, and that may involve the Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. Legal counsel hired by the new board indicate they only recently found out about these agreements, despite them being approved in public meetings. Counsel continued by calling the agreements unusual, suspect, and unlawful. Disney has responded with the following statement. All agreements signed between Disney and the district were appropriate and were discussed and approved in open, noticed public forums in compliance with Florida's government and the Sunshine Law. You see, it seems that Disney's lawyers did a pretty good job at securing things in the best interest of the company, and it wasn't done under lock and key. A detailed note about the restrictive covenant clause was recorded in the February 8th Reedy Creek agenda and meeting minutes and registered with the Orange County Comptroller. All of these documents are online, and the meeting wasn't private. 
anyone could have attended on February 8th. There were no public comments on the measure, which the board unanimously approved. In our interview, Dr. Aubrey Jewett stated, I'll be shocked if it's easily overturned. I won't be surprised if it's upheld. And in a recent Washington Post interview, University of Florida law professor Denia Wright, University of Florida law professor Denia Wright said it would be difficult to argue that the covenants are invalid given how common such covenants are and that Disney can say it had an interest in protecting itself from adverse actions by the incoming board. But this battle is far from over. Dr. Aubrey Jewett notes in the short term, DeSantis loses a little bit. In the long term, he might relish the fight. Disney's given them something else to attack now. For the governor, his major goal seems to be becoming the Republican nominee for president. Another fight with Disney might be in his best interest. Board member Bridget Ziegler has tweeted that the board won't back down, saying Disney has once again overplayed their hand in Florida. The Orlando Sentinel notes that the new board voted to bring in four outside law firms to review some of these matters and has indicated there is a chance we could see litigation go all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, could DeSantis just pass a new law? Well, that direction has proven problematic before when he'd planned to dissolve all special tax districts in the state, which would have put undue burden on neighboring counties to Reedy Creek. And any law that more broadly takes action against restrictive covenants or special districts could have broader consequences that would cause difficulty for the governor. Disney and the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District will remain in the headlines for months to come as this power struggle continues. We expect a lot more news and developments to come, and our team will be covering every update. You can follow along with all the news by signing up for our newsletter, following us on social media, and of course, subscribing to the channel right here. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.